Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. All right, well, good morning. Good morning. I can tell you that just about everything, even more, is in the book. So if you wanted just to relax and look at some of the bullet points that I'll present on the PowerPoint to help you follow along, but... <coughs> Um, even more is actually written in the book on this chapter. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, thank you. Well, this first presentation will be on forming seminary formators in the art of accompaniment. And Pope Francis, in Evangelii Gaudium in number 161 said, the church will have to initiate everyone, priests, religious, and laity, into this art of accompaniment, which teaches us to remove our sandals before the sacred ground of the other. The seminary formator is called to accompany on the journey of each man entrusted to his guidance through the seminary process. And this is not a mere functional role, but a genuine presence in the seminary's life and in his discernment process. So accompaniment. It means knowing a man on a deep level, walking alongside of him in the seminary horarium, and being with him in his joys and sorrows that he experiences throughout his time of formation. Anyone involved in seminary formation, bishops, vocation directors, faculty, and even the seminarian himself can gain from a deeper initiation into this art of accompaniment. The Congregation for Clergy in its ratio re-echoes Pope Francis's call to the seminary formator. It states, it is the task of every formator to assist the seminarian through accompaniment in becoming aware of his condition, of his talents, that he received, his frailties, so that he can become ever more receptive to the action of grace. These are challenging obligations. What are some of them? Seminary candidates today come with far less exposure to Catholic men than decades ago. They've not necessarily come from structured and predictable Catholic upbringing. Their weaknesses are less often known, less less often have to do with adolescent struggles, which would be a normal part of growth and development. The secularization of our culture and the advances in technology exposed them to worldly ways that decades ago were not in existence. 75% of children today under the age of two have used a smartphone or a tablet to play with games, videos, or engage in related video activities. This is a tenfold increase from six years ago. According to a recent study by the American Association of Pediatrics, children begin interacting with digital media at what age? Take a guess. Six months. Six months. Three months. Three months. Four months. <laughs> and 41% of children under the age of one use a mobile phone daily to play games, watch TV, and use apps. And this increases to 77% in two-year-olds, and this is a study by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Also, this generation knows the world of addiction, especially to pornography, and it's stated that 15% of men in America today admit to an addiction in pornography, and you well know if somebody admits to an addiction, the percentage is low. 
They're also exposed to online gaming with its violent and sexually promiscuous themes. And 8% of American teenage boys today admit to an addiction. Again, it's probably lower than what it actually is. So we know that electronic media is rewiring the brain. And this is coupled with our secularized society has contributed to a growing population of young persons who come with anxiety, depression. They also come older with worldly experiences and more deeply embedded daily habits that are not necessarily holy. So the document, the Ratio, speaks of the qualities of an effective formator as being possessed of human, spiritual, pastoral, and professional abilities and resources so as to provide the right kind of accompaniment that's balanced and respectful of the freedom and the conscience of the other person and that will help him in his human and spiritual growth. That's number 49. So this really requires that the priest is also well-formed. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that, but I would be remiss to at least not talk about the well-formed qualities of a formator because his strength depends on his relationship with Christ and that he lives his life rooted in identification with Christ. And again, you're very familiar with this, but I'm going to not eliminate this in a, at least um, acknowledging it. He has to be passionate for his priesthood. His vitality arises from his celebration of the sacraments of Holy Eucharist, recourse to the sacrament of reconciliation, nourished by sacred scripture, solidifies his union with the church as he prays the liturgy of the hours for the church, seeks to grow in self-knowledge himself, is aware of his strengths, and also is willing to address his areas of limitation and constantly striving for holiness, relying on the Holy Spirit and his own spiritual director. So this is kind of an obvious but not something to be um, dismissed. So regarding the role of an effective formator, the church documents state, from the beginning, it is a task of every formator to assist the seminarian in becoming aware of his condition, of the talents he's received, of his frailties, so that he can become more receptive to the actions of grace. The formator is to help the seminarian to know himself in depth, to accept himself with serenity, and to correct himself and to mature starting from real, not illusory roots and from the heart of the person. So in order to be able to provide the right kind of accompaniment, the ratio emphasizes that those who are marked out to become formators need a specific preparation and a generous dedication to the important task of formation. So I think this is the wonderful part of this particular program that you're all a part of right here. I'll reference the church documents on priestly formation and gleaning from the experience of dedicated seminary formators that I've had the privilege of working with over the decades. In this presentation, I'll outline a specific preparation for the important task of forming formators in the art of accompaniment. And I'll, I've delineated five steps of accompaniment which address some of the elements that the ratio refers to as the right kind of accompaniment. And in these five steps, I'll also address how to employ psychologists and psychiatrists to assist formators in the formation of seminarians, as well as speak about dialogue skills that are formative and how to employ them in a later presentation. And although this presentation is intended primarily for new seminary formators, I've been told that the steps are also helpful for seasoned formators as well, as in addition to having seasoned formators form new seminary formators. So let's begin. So the first step would be to you know, find out kind of some background information, kind of the groundwork of accompaniment. <coughs> 
So the process of discerning an authentic vocation to the priesthood requires that the formator come to a deeper understanding of who the seminarian is that he is to accompany. And this process begins even before the first meeting with a man. In in anticipation of the first meeting, I recommend that the formator acquaint himself with a man he is about to work with, how he lived his life to date, what others said about him. And this will be revealed as the formator reviews the elements of his seminary application. For example, his autobiography, which has a certain amount of information of how he presents himself, his letter of intent, where he really felt God calling him to a priestly vocation, what others said about him in letters of recommendation, and the summary of his psychological evaluation. And as you establish some of these protocols in your seminary, this should be available to you really at the very beginning of a man's journey as you're called to accompany him with a level of depth. As an integral part of admission of a candidate, the program for priestly formation also states that a seminary applicant should understand that the testing results will be shared with select seminary personnel in a way that permits a thorough review. And it's program for priestly formation number 52. And as a particular gift of God, the vocation to the priesthood and its discernment lie outside the narrow competence of psychology. And that's in guidelines. That's a document in in the church. And I can give you the title of that document um, because I was asked a question about it earlier. But it's one that came out in 2008 or 9, I believe. Guidelines for the use of psychology in the admission and formation of candidates to the priesthood. Exactly. Thank you. Um, So... When, when I say that it lies outside the competence of psychology, do not delegate the discernment of a vocation and whether or not a man has qualities that can be healed and work towards a formation just to the psychologist. You are the ones that live with a man. You have the formative environment of the seminary or religious community. You know a lot more about them than somebody who has done an evaluation usually over a day or two. That information is very useful but you have the grace of your office to really view a man and walk with him over the years. So you dialogue with somebody who has professional expertise in psychology, but just do not delegate the whole discernment process to that individual. And particular care is to be taken so that the professional opinions expressed by the experts are exclusively accessible to those responsible for formation. So there needs to be a level of confidentiality of who has access to this with a precise and binding proscription of using this in no other way than for the discernment of a vocation and for the candidate's formation. So the documents are saying that you have a right and a need to have access to this information, but for the sole purpose of a man's vocation, his formation, and towards discernment of he, if, whether or not he should be ordained. So that's a narrow purpose as to why you have access to some of that intimate information in a psychological report. Oftentimes, in my experience, um, in over 35 years of doing assessments and working with seminary formators in various dioceses, the formator is not offered any information about the psychological evaluation regarding the man that he's responsible to accompany. And this approach unwittingly is a missed opportunity for the formator to make use of the information contained in the psychological evaluation regarding the man's presenting level of affective maturity and where areas of affective maturity can be supported and fostered. Again, psychological evaluations, maybe 5% of them are to screen out who does not belong to the seminary. But 95% of the purpose of an evaluation is to have you find out where a man is currently in his level of maturity, where he has strengths, where he has frailties, where he might have some blocks, so you can help him grow. The purpose is to 
uh, really to help him grow, not to eliminate him. That's the main purpose. So having obtained, then, the appropriate written consent, the formator should look for characteristics of maturity noted in the seminary and psychological evaluation. So look for signs of affective maturity that are listed in the evaluation. For example, very simply, does the report suggest that this man gets along with others? Is he collaborative? Is he responsible? Is he service-oriented? Does he establish and maintain relationships with appropriate boundaries? And if your assessor is not giving you an indication of some of these qualities, you need to ask them to do so. Please give me some indication in your intake history of a man who gets along, who's collaborative, who's service-oriented, and give me some specific examples so that I know that this man is demonstrating these qualities. Such characteristics suggest good prognosis for human formation. A profile that suggests maybe affective immaturity might include feelings of entitlement, criticalness, isolative behaviors, a history of impaired judgment, repeated work and relationship difficulties, and conflicts with persons in roles of authority. Another area that's really important to look at, has he had any psychotherapy? Have the therapy issues been satisfactorily addressed? Your assessor needs to comment on this. Does he have multiple physical and medical concerns? Are there signs of compulsive behaviors or an addiction to internet or online gaming? Very common today when I ask seminarians what their hobbies are. Oh, online gaming. That might not be a problem but it really might be something they've become addicted to. That doesn't mean they can't become a priest, but it might be worth addressing um, in the amount of time and also some of the things that they're accessing because these online games have a lot of sexual innuendos and themes that I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, Is he um, also using alcohol um, inappropriately or any other substance abuse. Um, today it's less likely, but I think as we come forward with a medical legalization of marijuana, um, which is an addictive chemical and much stronger today than it was 15 years ago and increases psychosis and depression um, and why it's becoming legal, um, I won't get into that, but um, the disadvantages of it, rather the advantages of it, are really highly debated amongst physicians. So this is not a comprehensive list um, of characteristics which might suggest you looking for qualities like this in a psychological evaluation. But becoming aware of a seminarian's affective strengths and weaknesses noted in a psychological evaluation will help you guide the process of accompanying a seminarian. Okay, step number two clarifying expectations and accompaniment. So it's important to establish parameters for your formation meetings. You know, to state the time, the length, the frequency, and the location of the formation meetings. That sounds pretty basic, but if if you can imagine just being a new seminarian and not knowing, it's very helpful to know those things ahead of time. In addition to having you tell them these things, it's mentoring them to maybe also do this with their parishioners, to be clear in their communication about some specifics that are not obvious. Because some of this is is actually lacking in the younger generation. And explain the purpose of um, a formation meeting and the focus of the meetings. So keep it in mind that the goal of formation is to carry out vocational discernment, to shape the heart of a priest, and to be formed as a missionary disciple of Christ. It's not that he's going to try to become your best friend or just talk about you know, sports. There's a, you know, that doesn't mean you don't talk about some social things, but there is a focal purpose for a formation meeting. So remind the seminarian that he's the one who also has primary responsibility for his formation and that the work of formation is dependent upon the Holy Spirit. 
and the interior commitment that he makes to exercise initiative in every aspect of his life. It's his free will engagement in the process of formation that will lead him to a deeper um, process each, each day of his commitment if he is indeed called to the priesthood. Also, let the seminary know how to best contact you. If you prefer email or cell phone or office phone, you know, persons vary with their preferences. Um, also, let the um, formator tell the seminary how to best reach him in the case of an emergency or if he wants to cancel an appointment or if there's more a desire to meet with you outside of regular meetings. Those can be very helpful, but also allow for accountability. Well, I didn't know how to reach you or I didn't want to bother you. You know, you already are beginning to allow a, an ambiance of, I'm available to you. These are ways to reach me, and we can work something out. Essential to the process of accompaniment, which we've heard about, of course, is mutual trust. And the format is to create an atmosphere of trust and safety in which it will be possible for the seminarian, in times of joy, suffering, frustration, dryness, to speak with you as a formator about his day-to-day vocational journey. Accompaniment is a gradual process. It's a kind of pilgrimage, if you will. And the program for priestly formation should explore and outline concrete ways in which this trust can be encouraged and safeguarded. And this is from the Ratio, number 47. The relationship between the formator and the seminarian is also one of parameters of confidentiality. Respecting the seminarian's right of privacy is necessary, but careful management of confidential materials must be observed. However, the right to privacy does not mean keeping secrets. So we spent a whole day kind of talking about that yesterday. So clarifying expectations for your formation meetings will allow the seminarian to better demonstrate his earnest desire to cooperate with the formation process. And if the seminarian fulfills these expectations that are clarified, this would demonstrate an earnest desire to cooperate in the process of formation. If he doesn't come prepared to his formation meeting but instead focuses on discussing sports, you might point that out to him. If he frequently comes late for morning prayer, but he's always on time for breakfast, you have something to address. Clarifying expectations also communicates that the formator is available to the seminarian and desires to support him in his formation process. Step three, discovering God's design through the review of life in accompaniment. Although reading the seminarian's background is important, The formator needs to come to know the man himself. You need to come to know the man. Learn about his life history as articulated directly from him in formation meetings. So you're to remind him that the conversation during the formation meetings depends on him to pray, to consult the Holy Spirit regarding what should be discussed. And there may be a long-awaited Um, question that remains or a situation that's troubling him or a relationship that challenges him that he may be struggling with a passion or may be delighting in the way God has moved him in his life but you're to invite him to join you in an attentive listening for what God seeks to reveal to him so the purpose of dialogue is to explore together God's design for him And the ratio emphasizes the importance of the review of life in order to develop an individualized plan of formation. In order for this training to be fruitful, it is important that every seminarian be aware of his own life history and be ready to share it with his formators. Again, we all each have a very unique salvation history. And just as a seminary recognizes positive qualities of a seminarian's prior formation can both indicate a vocation and provide a solid foundation for further growth, it should also address possible deficiencies in the candidate's earlier formation and find means to address them. So to be be formative, a company must include, right from the beginning, recognizing through the lens of faith the deeper meanings of certain events in the seminarian's life history 
for example, how God was present to him, um, though he might not have been aware of it at the time. Looking at something that happened through the lens of faith is an opportunity to ponder how past experiences are part of God's unfolding design for salvation. And we've also, all of us, have had some experiences that only make sense in the light of the present circumstances. Um, In my own experience, I had a move while I was in medical school, so I was out of sequence with a cardiology um, rotation. And so when I was doing gastrointestinal medicine in Lansing, I saw a cardiologist on staff. I thought, oh, I'd love to do a rotation with him. Maybe I can you know, make up my rotation time here. And I asked him if I could work with him. And he says, well, you know, I'm just going back to my regular practice. And I said, oh, where's that? Well, he said, Alma, Michigan. Well, little did I know, because I had this move, and then I found this cardiologist and asked to work with him in Alma, Michigan, that God would reveal to me a vocation to religious life. I had no, no thought of becoming a sister then. I wasn't even Catholic at the time. So, again, how powerful that can be when you kind of look back. How was God's presence throughout an aspect of my own salvation history? Because I was quite distressed. It put me out of sequence. But what a gift that was in that hiccup that I experienced. So this step of seeking a deeper understanding of the events of the seminary and salvation history continues throughout his journey of accompaniment. So step four, fostering human maturation in accompaniment. Vocational accompaniment offers the seminarian a means to gradually come to grow in self-knowledge. So with what has been gleaned over the course of formation meetings, the format is to help the seminarian acquire a more accurate understanding of himself and thus to grow in personal freedom. So a more comprehensive understanding of the seminarian's life history will be key in order to identify together areas where he can grow in self-knowledge and address deficiencies in his affective level of functioning. So appropriate self-disclosure and a cultivated capacity for self-reflection and accountability are really key if an accompanied formation is to take place. A a seminary may do do well academically, but if self-reflection, accountability, and appropriate self-disclosure are not developing qualities in the man, then he may be stunted in his human formation. And we all know that St. John Paul spoke of the fact that human formation is the underpinning for affective maturity. So in our practicum today, we'll take a closer look at markers of human maturation and the tremendous assistance that they can be in getting a feel for a seminarian's level of affective functioning and how how you can help him gain a deeper understanding of himself and where to guide him to bear fruit from his formation. The Ratio describes how the seminarian, in sharing his life history, um, can offer opportunities for affective growth through appropriate self-disclosure. We've heard this in the documents. You want to hear about their experiences of childhood. You want to hear about their adolescence and the influence that family has had on them. That is part of your bounded area of information to explore and walk with a man together. So consider a seminarian who had difficult relationship with his father. This relationship will more likely manifest affective or emotional expression in future situations that may trigger similar emotions. A seminarian may project unresolved hurts from his past experiences with his father onto authority persons he relates to in the present. So psychological projection involves projecting undesirable feelings or emotions onto someone else in the present rather than realizing that it had to do with a past relationship. And this is very, very common. So a seminarian may react with fear and aggression toward his formator, superiors, or certain parishioners if they remind him of a difficult relationship with his father, but he would be greatly benefited by having you help him become more aware of this and the emotional (coughs) residue that he's experienced of his past and the impact that this is having on present relationships. So until we are aware of something, we can't bring it to self-knowledge. And often, if we aren't aware of something, we need somebody else to bring it to our awareness. Once something is brought to 
awareness, we can bring it to self-knowledge. Then we can move it to some self-direction because we can move it in, in a different way once we have some insight. Once we learn a different way to respond to certain situations, then we develop a little self-control. We're developing a little bit of habit. And once we have a little bit of self-control, we have a little bit more self-discipline. And then we have a little bit more self-governance, which is actually more true human freedom. So unless we're aware of some of this, we can't move towards really being more free in how we function. Unaddressed projections then will hinder his ability to grow in freedom, make choices that really formation requires. So the formator is to guide the seminarian to open himself to a continuum of transformations from within his own life history. This will at times include personal mentoring, and the document speaks about that. They, the formators, observe seminarians and assist them in growing humanly by offering them feedback about their general demeanor, their relational capacities and styles, maturity, capacity to assume the role of a public person and leader in a community, and their appropriation of human virtues that make them men of communion. These same formators may on occasion teach the ways of human development and even offer some personal mentoring or at times coaching. More generally, they offer encouragement, support, and challenge along the formational path. And that's, um, you know, from the PPF number 80. But when you hear that, you know, that describes to me such a beautiful example of a spiritual father. You know, that you really are walking with him. You want his good. You want to be with him. And you heard yesterday the distinction between the role of a spiritual director. He's also a spiritual father, but it is much more with regards to his relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ, his interiority of that prayer life and how that moves outward but this is really the man to man, the human stuff that becomes more than enriched by a vocation that has you know, particular qualities that will allow him then to be a spiritual father and I think so much of what formators do really has to do with spiritual fatherhood so as part of addressing affective growth and development in the seminarians, a seminar a formator I worked with addressed personal hygiene and table manners with his men. If a seminarian looked unkempt, the formator gave him immediate feedback. If, he, if there was body odor, the formator reminded the seminarian that he's a public person. He would say, parishioners do, do not want to speak with somebody who has bad body odor. If a seminarian came down for breakfast unshaven and he was not trying to grow a beard, the formator waited until he had a hot plate of breakfast before him. He sent him upstairs to go shave, clean up, and came back down then for breakfast, which at that point in time was a cold plate. He said they quickly get the point and they change. Addressing areas of human formation in timely fashion also communicates that the formator is invested in the seminarian's human formation and desires that he grow in self-discipline. Now, seminaries are not looking for perfect candidates, but we should have some basic expectations. So in the process of fostering affective growth, the formator will want to remind the seminarian that the goal of formation is to be configured to Christ as a man of communion. The formator will emphasize that to be configured to Christ cannot be completed without regular and faithful encounters with Christ in prayer. And that prayer, joined with the seminarian's cooperation with human and spiritual formation, aided by grace, leads him to respond to God, who speaks to his heart, with the deepest core of his personality. It took the disciples time to take on the heart and the mind of Christ. And the formator is to guide the seminarian to discern where conversion is gradually evolving, where it is slowly evolving, or not taking place. And again, I'll discuss that tomorrow when we review a practicum on looking at affective markers of human maturation, where there's affective maturity or affective immaturity with some specific questions, and then an assessment that you can use if you so desire to help the man evaluate himself that will be good for your own note-taking. So such awareness invites the seminarian to make deliberate changes where necessary. So assessing for qualities of human maturation seeks to ascertain the degree to which seminary formation has been interiorized 
For example, is a seminarian exhibiting maturation in his thoughts, feelings, behaviors that embody and manifest a potential for missionary discipleship? Where are areas of further growth needed, practical recommendations to be made for furthering human development? Formators need to be adequately prepared, says the guidelines, to carry out a discernment that fully respecting the church's doctrine on priestly vocation allows for a reasonably sure decision as to whether the seminary should be advanced in formation. There are times when it is discovered that the seminarian has psychological wounds that are outside the realm of the formator's sense of competency to address. It's important to refer to a professional in such instances, especially if areas of woundedness can be healed and free the seminarian to embrace a vocation to priesthood. Again, counseling is, is intended to aid a seminarian's potential to actually then be ordained if that's what is being offered by God. Grace builds on nature. If the man is young with some therapy, he may be free to engage in formation. Older seminarians may be harder to work with depending on how open they are to what they also need to look at. And there are also circumstances where the effects of wounds will not be sufficiently alleviated in therapy. And such a case will hinder the man from reaching the affective maturity necessary for priestly ministry. So this is very key here. If more psychological work is being done than human or spiritual work, the man should not be advanced in formation. This doesn't mean that he's not loved by God, but he may not have a priestly vocation. He may have had a powerful conversion in the Catholic faith or a reversion back to the faith. This does not indicate necessarily a priestly vocation. Maybe his conversion was a coping mechanism. If the seminarian does not respond after a time circumscribed of therapy, it's necessary to determine whether he has a vocation. Remember, therapy is not human formation. If the formator is working harder than the seminarian or therapeutic issues predominate, It's an injustice to keep the man in the seminary. A seminary may be most intellectual and prayerful candidate, but if human formation is not taking place, he'll be less effective as a priest. And seminaries provide tremendous opportunities for human development, but they can't supply everything. Now, you need to be honest with candidates who come to your seminary. Remember, the squeaky wheel in the seminary, if ordained, becomes a squeaky wheel in the parish with parishioners, and we don't need more of that. In some cases, it might have been more charitable to discontinue formation after a year, and this can be the greatest difficulty for formators. If a seminarian is there for three years and he still is not who the formation team thinks he needs to be, he needs to be dismissed from seminary for his sake and for the sake of the church. You know, this is really a very important point. There's such a tendency to just wait another year and wait another year and wait another year. That is a disservice to the man who maybe needs more intensive time. And the program for priestly formation makes it very clear that um, seminarians in need of long-term therapy should avail themselves of such assistance before entering the seminary or should leave the program until therapy has been completed. If such departure is indicated, there should be no expectation of automatic readmission. A candidate should not be considered for advancement to holy orders if he's engaged in long-term psychological therapy. Issues being addressed in counseling should be satisfactorily settled before the call to holy orders. And often they give a time frame of more than two years. So long-term therapy is more than two years. So it's something to really look at. I'm not saying that if a man in seminary is in therapy longer than that, But if the issues are not really getting resolved and you're not seeing fruit of his formation, then you really need to take a pause about this and wonder, is it it that he's too wounded? Is it that the therapy he's getting from the therapist is not helpful? Maybe he needs another therapist. There are many things to consider. um, And, you know, so I think those are important factors. So the formator needs to look for signs that manifest progress in becoming configured to Christ. And key for looking at these signs is what motivates the seminarian to do what he does and in what manner he does what he does. Is he motivated by Christ and love for the church? Are there signs of his willingness to give himself to others, even in small ways? 
Does he regard and treat each person with respect and dignity? Does he exhibit charity? Does he encounter others in their real needs, especially in the poor, the elderly, and the difficult? Is he patient in difficult situations? Does he readily forgive? Does he seek forgiveness? Does he lead persons with a pastoral sensitivity to their joys and sufferings? Is he humble in carrying out tasks assigned to him? Does he have a simple lifestyle? Does he accept suffering and endure suffering as a participation in the redemptive work of Christ? Does his love for the church motivate a fraternal attitude toward persons, one configured to Christ, engenders in another a profound experience of belonging? So the formator is responsible for discerning whether the seminary is embracing and benefiting from formation. So some closing recommendations. To promote the right kind of accompaniment, I offer the following. Develop a consent form, written permission for each seminary candidate for you to be able to access the materials that you need and for what purpose. Specify the persons who may have access, only the persons who may have access to an evaluation. Indicate that the use of the evaluation be for explicit purpose of his seminary vocational growth, development, and discernment. And also establish protocols for access and use of psychiatric evaluations when the seminary has undergone therapy. Determine the period of your retention of records and establish a policy for the destruction of these records by dioceses, religious communities, and seminaries. And really establish some similar retention protocols for the records that you keep as a formator. You should take a few notes on a formation session that you can go back to. I know myself as a therapist, if I don't take a few notes, you know, and a year goes by, I'm going to have trouble remembering where I've walked. And it helps me also be more on task as well and look for examples of where I've seen a difficulty and where somebody now is manifesting, you know, growth in that area or not. Is it because I haven't been clear? Is it because they haven't engaged? Because they didn't know how to engage? Because they don't want to engage? All of those, what motivates what I'm observing is very important. So in conclusion... I'd like to consider taking a passage from the Gospel of John that illustrates the process of accompaniment in formation. Consider the actions of Jesus as he speaks to the women at the well and the similarities of the process of accompaniment. The woman encounters Jesus at the well. He poses questions to her. She's guarded with her answers. He speaks the truth in love to her. He does not condemn her. The Samaritan woman receives the truth about herself from Jesus because she experiences his love. She can now speak freely. She knows herself loved and accepted despite her human frailties. As she begins to know her true self through the experience of Christ's merciful love, she is freed to joyfully proclaim the good news. In an ordinary action of formation meeting, there is something extraordinary taking place. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.